start the show, better take your seats. Exciting. I was <laughs> like really pumped up after that. Right. Uh, Let's hi, it <laughs> so um I want to start first with a video. I'm gonna put Bertram on the spot um before oh good win. We have Brian. Hi Brian. Uh, I'm gonna start with a video and hopefully this works. Um and then we'll do introductions and we'll go through all of that. But I just wanted to kind of set the stage with a with a video. So here we here we go. Can everybody see this? Oh, there we go. Look sharp. <laughs> oh, it looks like we're missing the audio. Oh, there's no audio. Yeah, I think there was a note to click something. We got it. All right. Well, that's fine. So well, well, um, well, you can let it play, and I can just do the voiceover live. <laughs> oh, that would be so cool! Really? Will you do it? No, no, no. It was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, I'm sorry about the video. Uh, we'll link it after this, and so you guys can watch it. But um, I'm Ruby Zelinsky. I work for the Memphis River Parks Partnership. Um, we work to trigger the transformative power of the river, the Mississippi River here in Memphis. Uh, we manage 250 acres of park space and, uh, and we program it and we cut the grass and all sorts of things. So, um, so we, I'm looking at it right now, so that's why I keep looking up. Uh, I have three super, super cool guys with me today and um, I, I, we had a short conversation on Monday where we all kind of got together and I just told them how, how inspiring it is to be to be able to talk to them in this way uh, in this conversation. So I'm going to let them kind of introduce themselves, but I'll point them out uh, individually. So um, Brian, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Brian Joe. I'm the executive director of TriStar Arts and uh, co-founder. And uh, I'm talking to you today with a, a special highlight on our work with Memphis River Parks to bring two really amazing Hank Willis Thomas sculptures to Memphis for I think it's a total of 20 months. We have those installed back in April, uh, mid-April, and they'll be on view in Memphis at Fourth Bluff Park until November 1st, 2021. So um, that's part of one of the many things we do just to um, foster um, the conversation across the state with contemporary art, uh, talking about a state scene and, and just talking about how art can can transform people's experiences. So, um, yeah, that's try to cool. Bertram. Sweet. Hello, everyone. My name is Bertram Williams. I'm a co-founder of Deep Art of Media. And like Brian and the TriStar Arts fam, have been privileged to work alongside the Memphis River Parks team in this um, co-creative effort in Fort Bluff Park. And so um, at Deepwater, our bent is developing wellness media, uh, media that helps folks heal. It's obviously entertaining, uh, but ultimately impacts community in a way that will leave us better off. And so. Um, that is what we are looking to do through this project in Fourth Bluff Park, and are really excited to, you know, talk through uh, in this panel about how we plan to transform 
people's lives through uh, these public installations. Amazing. And our new friend, Will. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Will Sylvester. Um, I'm an artist and a principal at Create to Devastate, which is a, a company founded to help artists uh, create works, uh, public um, and otherwise. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here because I've worked with Hank for many years. Um, uh, creating his public artworks and helping him build uh, the many works that you've seen. Um, and the bench also, one of the benches in uh, Fourth Bluff is actually named after my grandmother and my partner's grandmother as well. So it's just a uh, thank you all for having me here. It's amazing to be here. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be able to talk to you today. So. Um, so this conversation is really around public art and uh, the transformation of spaces and how public art can influence those spaces. Uh, we have a very unique park uh, in Memphis and uh, just like our neighbors in other, other states, we're, we're tackling issues around you know, Confederate, Confederate monuments, Confederate spaces, um, and, and how to kind of recreate those spaces and, uh, and kind of heal Feel what has happened um, in those public spaces and welcome people back. So, um, so the collaboration, uh, the video that I was going to show, uh, is, is kind of centered around this collaboration with Bertram that was sparked by the collaboration with Brian about bringing these Hank Willis Thomas sculptures um, to Memphis uh, after we re remade and re redid the, the park here in Memphis called Fourth Bluff Park. So. Um, I kind of want to jump right in. Brian, I want to start with you because um, I think that, you know, we started this process um, a year and a half ago. Uh, and it feels like kind of, you always say that we feel kind of lucky that we we got these sculptures here. But can you kind of talk about what, you know, what that process looks like and, you know, why Memphis, why Fourth Bluff Park, um, you know, and, and how, how did we how did we pull it off? Well, I think that Firstly, just the, the exercise of institutions collaborating, particularly nonprofits, is, is something that I look for um, in our statewide programming. I think it's a really um, healthy way for organizations to stretch themselves and just to essentially double their networks. And I, I feel like that's really been successful um, in our work with Ruby and the River Parks and excited uh, for that. With any public art uh, installation, there's a whole host of logistics that need to be covered. And so, yeah, I, I think that we started talking about this in spring, maybe April or May of, of 2019. Um, and so it was pretty much a year leading up to the installation, but really good conversations that I think would pave the way for future collaborations. Um, with us or, or with anyone else that you guys end up working with. So I think that just the exercise of, of those logistics and the mutual desire to kind of stretch and, and double our organizational impact has been really positive. I think with the selection of Hank's work, we were able to really, um, really achieve our key goal, which is to select work that is um, extremely well done, um, a picture of the artist's total studio practice and work that is really accessible, uh, both visually, uh, physically, and just the, the narratives that exist in the work. So um, Hank is someone who's uh, a leader uh, in the arts world and beyond. Um, he's a, an activist and just someone who, in my conversations with him, has has inspired me in, uh, personally just in, in what I do. So I think that um, the, the short answer is um, lots of months of planning, but fun, fun planning and uh, just an artist who's been a delight to work with. Um, someone who has known Memphis, has visited Memphis in the past, um, is in the collection of Elliot Kimberly Perry, someone who uh, who gets a lot of um, you know what you know growth is happening in Memphis. He sees it 
and he's uh, he's part of it very tangibly. And I think one of the amazing things that happened was that somehow the sculptures the sculptures came from New York City on a truck, and they were craned into the park in April. So you know we were like March running into this pandemic, and we were freaking out that these sculptures were not going to make it even you know to the park, and it was like you know, are they, are they coming? Are they not coming? And I think something that we talked about Monday was, you know, how lucky we are that they made it. And in a time when you can't go to a museum and a time when you can't go to the indoor spaces, you know, the sculptures are there. Yeah. I think just the, the accessibility is something that's really a big deal. Um, I think that we're still figuring out how to engage safely with indoor spaces. I mean, certainly, just fewer people and, and smart health practices. But I think that accessibility physically, um, you know, there, there's no opening closed times in the same way as museums uh, and galleries. And I think that it's just a, a way to expand the range of um, how to find art in Memphis and beyond and the range of um, how art can be experienced. And so I think it's been really special to have these um, and yeah, it really came down to the wire. I think they're put up <laughs> on the truck in upstate New York, which is like an even longer distance. And, and <laughs> they had to come through the city and they had to get through because I think that um, 18 wheeler traffic was suspended for a while there coming out of the city in the spring. So I think we might have just made it. So I got the video and I'm told that if I put it in my browser, I can play it. And I really want to play it before Bertram goes because I think it really sets the stage for what he has to talk about. And I also feel like we keep saying sculpture and you guys are probably thinking like, what do these things look like? So um, I'd like to show this. Let's see if I can do this. There. There. Um, all right. Share audio. Got it. Let me know if you can hear it. Can we hear something? Yeah. Can you turn it up? Because the world seems to be breaking and healing at the same damn time. Why do we need to heal? Because this city has both perpetrated and been victim to over 200 years of systematic trauma and violence, a burden that has been largely carried by Black, Latinx, LGBTQ+, working class folks that have been capitalized on for generations. It is time for us to lay down this burden. And it starts when we choose ourselves, our health, our healing. In my healing journey, I've often found solace in Fourth Bluff Park. I'm elated at the idea of curating a space to help folks like me find the peace I found. We at Deepwater Media will be designing and installing a soundscape comprised of the many voices of Mother Nature and all her children. We want you to come and listen, meditate, pray, move, and connect with the people who will help heal the heart of Memphis. Pull up. So much better now. Um, hopefully you were able to hear it. Yes? Good. Okay. So Bertram, <laughs> I've put you on the spot and now I'm going to put you on the spot again. So talk a little bit about this poetry project. You know, we've talked a lot about this is not like what people would normally call like public art, but I think in our minds that means like sound and audio and music and things like that. So so kind of expand on on what this kind of means in terms of public art sense and then how this project is really working. Sure thing. I first have to say that I'm so embarrassed having shown that in front of such <laughs> consummate artists, especially a documentary filmmaker like Will. And so it's <laughs> like, I'm knowing that he's like, yo, the audio, you know, making all of these critiques. But yeah. at any rate, at any rate, um, this, uh, funny enough, talking to Will, uh, I came to this realization that the 
collaboratives uh, between our team and Memphis River Parks to create experiences that they are, in my opinion, a public art, right? Being able to uh, show and perform and bring folks together uh, to a space, uh, sir, I, I think it fits the, the definition, uh, but also um, I have learned over the years that music in the public space has a really unique power to kind of help folks tap into and speak through that universal language that is music. And so we um, we are really looking to explore that uh, in this fourth Bluff Park effort. And so what it looks like, uh, and I'll be, you know, I'm hoping we'll get to dig a little deeper into the science, so to speak, of it later. But the uh, broad stroke of it is that in addition or in complement to these uh, beautiful pieces uh, sent to us from the Hank Wolf Thomas and team, um, we are looking to create like a wraparound or second layer of experience for park goers. And we really are hoping to push the boundaries by using tones, using sounds, using utterances, using mantras that will have people leave the park changed, hopefully for the better. Uh, so the underlying, uh, I guess the guiding light that kind of the parks team gave us was that we are looking to incorporate uh, the written word, incorporate poetry and have it whispered through the trees. And so I've been uh, working with a team of folks that have really been writing thoughtfully and like from a really heartfelt place, some pieces that we believe will um, that will um, help folks at least start uh, if they aren't already navigating the healing process. So I'll stop there. I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> I think it was great. Um, so Will, I think you know this like fits in perfectly with you. When we initially talked, you know, maybe a month or so ago, uh, you know, for the first time you had talked about where these sculptures started and the like the idea of poetry and words and, and all of that kind of like happening and being an inspiration for these. So the connection is really interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you fell into public art and you know, it, it wasn't like a intentional thing. And so kind of talk about your transformation, your personal transformation through kind of like getting involved with Hank and, and public art world. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Wow, uh, my getting in public. So I come from a film, um, more of a like a sociology anthropology background. That's what I studied in college. Um, but I did a lot of editing and film and stuff. And uh, I actually started working with Hank in 2012 on a project called Question Bridge Black Males. Um, and that project was about connecting black men to other black men around the United States. Um, and we would go around and have these questions and have them answer the questions. And then we did this exhibition and installation work. Um, but shortly after, um, almost immediately after, um, Hank invited me to join up with uh, a group of artists and ethnographers called the Cause Collective. Um, the, the Cause Collective uh, would create public artworks that um, would invite um, the, the public and the audience, typically, what we've done a lot of is we've worked with um, communities as we've traveled with our project called The Truth Booth and asking people to uh, give uh, up to two minutes of what their what the truth means to them, starting with the statement, the truth is. Um, we've also done a project at the Birmingham airport where we looked at the history and uh, the, the like contemporary history um, you know, people every day of Birmingham and Alabama as a whole and invited them to, you know, be in front of the camera and add to the installation that is, uh, I think, on an indefinite installation um, at the Birmingham airport. Um, so, you know, that's how me and Hank really got started. And as far as the benches, the benches really stem from the Truth Project. Um, it started from I would say, I think it's 22 line poem. I always get this mixed up because there's probably a lot more lines, but we've whittled it down to about 22 lines. Um, and all the lines start with the truth is, like the truth is I love you, the truth is I see you, the truth is I know you, um, and so on. And so from you know just having these speech bubbles 
with these lines in them. Um, Hank came up with the idea of doing the benches and he started with Ernest and Ruth, um, which is the black bench that I think was in the video. Um, and that's actually, he named that after his grandmother and grandfather. Um, and so in, I believe it was, I cannot remember. I think it was maybe 16, 2016, 2017. Actually, no, 2017, I think it was. Um, we uh, we decided to expand on the benches and do more speech bubbles. Um, one is like a square speech bubble. The other one is a cloud, like a thought bubble. And the blue one that you saw in the video is like the yell, the pow bubble, as we like to call it. Um, and that one is actually, as I mentioned earlier, named after um, my grandmother and actually my partner's grandmother who works with Hank as well, um, Harriet and Anne. Um, and what's really interesting for both of us um, and that speech bubble is that we had made it, we had built it, it hadn't gone to exhibition yet. Um, and then unfortunately, both of our grandmothers passed away within about two days of each other. Um, and it was uh, something that was like a bit trying for the both of us, but when like maybe a week or so later we were exhibiting the, we opened the exhibition for the, the benches and we got to just sit down in the benches and it was, very much like being in their presence again, um, that it was just a really powerful kind of movement and something that we get to carry with us everywhere. Um, actually, we were just talking about, we're doing a road trip um, on our, I'm currently in Wyoming, <laughs> uh, a little bit out there. Uh, I live in New York. And so um, we actually just got a car and we're gonna drive back, but I think we actually might pass through Memphis um, and just sit with the bench, the bench for a little bit, and you know, be with our grandmothers just another time. And it's so cool that we get to do that and get to be in public, and you know, wherever she goes, our grandmothers go as well. I love that. Please come to Memphis. We would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a big tour. It'll be great. Um, and so I kind of want to dig into a little bit of this. Um, Bertram kind of alluded to it, but uh, I want to dig in into the kind of theories that you guys have about about public art and about art in these spaces um, specifically. And and Brian, I really love what you said on Monday about being like in the work. Can you kind of describe that that phrase and what that means to you about being kind of in in the work? Yeah, it comes from a video clip I saw back when I was in college at UT. Um, it was the original Art 21 clip of Martin Purrier in his studio from the early 2000s. And he is talking about one of his pieces and then stops and, and just says, but I think the meaning is in the work. And I, I think there's something about that exchange, that sort of um, fluidity of the artist putting themselves and their intent and their message uh, into the, the visual physicality of the work and having that mis message go forward as a visual and physical communication and, and also to be received by uh, viewers and the audience that is, is so amazing to me. And, and really, when I heard that, I, I realized that the bar had been set. Um, not only is Martin Prairie's work a very high bar, he's one of the, you know, the living legends of um, the art world, um, but also just that very succinct way of explaining when something works. And so I think that's a message for artists but I also think it's a really great message for viewers. And the message is to trust your instincts. When you go into a space with art, indoor or outdoor, trust that your eye and your feet are moving you into a visual conversation that is supposed to happen, that is about you. And it's not about a right or wrong or how much um, or how few reference points you have coming into it. Um, you know, that's, that's the meeting point where the artist 
Purrier in this instance has put uh, his own being into the sculpture for this, uh, this communication, this effort at communication. And what art does in the 21st century is it asks the viewer to put themselves into the experience and it affirms that experience. And these two sculptures, these benches by Hank are, are really great at um, offering that opportunity to the public saying, come to me with, um, with your identity, with your experiences and, and also receive this work so to me, as an artist, as someone who um, is an administrator, programmer, curator, I, I think all of that, all of those directions leading into art are all for the same end, for there to be that really significant meeting point uh, between the public and the work. And I'm really excited for how that happens generally in Hank's work, but it's very excited for Promethians and anyone who visit these two sculptures to have the potential for that kind of transformative experience. And, and I love what Bertram is saying about adding like a sonic layer to that. I think in the art community, we all have to kind of push in our chips and bring what we can uh, to the table. But as a sculptor, what I love about sculpture is it in, invites you to do sort of a dance to, it invites you to use your body and to move your body in, in one way or the other and to engage a kind of muscle memory that you take with you and can remember after the fact. I always write things down that Brian says that are like little nuggets, but I love that push in your chip thing. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. Uh, Bertram, I'm gonna hand it off to you because I feel like that like totally leads perfectly into kind of the the core of like what you're what you're doing and um you know how, how do we how do we push this even further and not only have people feel like they're a part of this but actually put them in the space yeah uh i i agree wholeheartedly with brian um you know i, I see our chips that are being pushed in <laughs> it's like uh to use another uh, analogy we are greasing the wheels right because uh, uh mr thomas's work to me speaks very clearly right and in body and spirit i feel it and it engenders a type of like conversation and you know i'm really excited to um watch and learn how people with the the sonic layer are supported in having that conversation uh because um you know, there are a couple of things that are super important. Like we got to think about the geography uh, being in Memphis. Um, we, we are a burgeoning um, community as it relates to, in my opinion, and I could be off, but in terms of like appreciation of the arts, which is why I feel uh, the work that Whitney and folks at Third Space are doing is so important. Um, and, you know, what, what we are hoping to do when that family or that young person, that young boy stands in front of one of the sculptures or is sitting there or walking through the park, that we will be able to uh, really help um, help to spark new ideas. Uh, in fact, I wanna, if we can kind of make this a working meeting, uh, Will, <laughs> I am interested in the truth phrases that you mentioned because we should record those as well, right? And incorporate those into, uh, into the piece. And so, uh, um, you know, I, I'd also say that um, we have a chance through this effort because there are so many layers, because we have this perfect marriage of this really important public space, this really uh, important, these important works important partners in terms of TriStar and Will, uh, that we are able to leverage all of that so as to tease out more voices too uh, that will support uh, the life of this thing. And we have some really cool examples of folks who have really incorporated uh, sound into public spaces. 
But uh, I think above all, what is top of mind for me is having those people that visit to feel compelled to speak, to say a thing, to engage with the project and eventually hear themselves over the speakers uh, at the next visit. And so um, in that way, we create this fully immersive, interactive uh, public art experience that will no doubt transform some folks, even if it's just one, you know? <laughs> I think it's going to be more than one, Bertram. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm one. It's already transforming me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to I want to call on Will again um, because I think that one of the things that you know we as artists have to do is continue to grow and change and evolve with every project that we put out, with every chip that we push. So can you talk a little bit about that kind of evolution and you know? watching Hank evolve, you know, from these pieces, watching your work evolve, you know, and as you move, you know, from New York to Wyoming and back. Um, <laughs> but talk a little bit about that kind of like that evolution of, of work and art. Well, first, uh, Bertram, I will send you the poem. Um, <laughs> you read it. I want, I would love to hear you read that. <laughs> For sure. Um, as far as like evolution goes, well, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, I think, because, you know, for every work that we make as artists, you know, well, one thing is for me, every work I make is like never finished is kind of one of the things that I always say. And I always have to have someone else tell me when to stop. And I think Hank is very much the same way. Um, working with him for almost 10 years, um, and being in the studio and seeing how, you know, you we make a work and, you know, maybe put out one version of it. Um, and then maybe a few years later, revisit that, whether it be materials or subject matter. Um, it was always, you know, time to revisit something that we did in the past, maybe a few years ago, maybe a few months ago. Um, and we would always do that. So in fact, if you look at Hank's entire body of work, which really starts with photography and sort of makes its way um, using just photo, like photo paper to different materials to print on, to then the idea, he has this thing um, called punctum sculptures, where it's taking uh, photographs and then transforming them into three-dimensional um, images um, as sculptures. And so that directly connects to, you know, photography um, and then it's sculpture. And then from sculpture to, you know, oh, speech bubbles, truth booth, let's make speech bubble benches. Let's, let's make this, you know, um, a sculpture now. So it's, it's always evolving. Um, and in particular, like, the, like I was saying, the, the truth, it started with a poem. Um, you know, just 22 lines and then some signs that would say, you know, the truth is I love you. And, you know, from there, it's actually evolved into, um, I actually just got a phone call the other day about the truth tree that is uh, being redeveloped, um, which is a sculpture, but it's a big tree that has these speech bubble leaves coming off of it. Um, and in and, and, and that process that, you know, if I may be done with one thing for now, but it could be more later, that nothing is ever really finished, um, I think is my greatest takeaway from just thinking about evolution of art. It's just like, nothing is ever really finished. I think we can always keep building on it. And that might just be some deeper thoughts of just life in general <laughs> that I might have always, but yeah, is that we're just always- yeah, I think it's great. And I, I kind of am curious also about this, like this somewhat strange move to Wyoming and, you know, the culture shock of what that was and like what that meant for you and what you've done to kind of change that. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So um, my partner at the, well, let me back up. So uh, my partner's father has cancer, had cancer, has cancer. It'll never go away. It's one of those weird things. Um, but he scheduled his 
bone marrow transplant in the like the first week of March. Um, and then, oh no, you know, pandemic. Um, so uh, my partner basically, I don't, for lack of a better term, trapped out here, but I think it was a welcomed uh, trapping, if you will, of just being like, oh, you know, we can't travel so much anymore. Um, I guess I'll just stay out here. And so she was out here and then after a while, I was like, I'm coming. <laughs> um, and I'd been out here once before, um, and it's a very small town. I think there's 450 people. We're about an hour and a half, maybe two hours away from the nearest city. Um, actually, it might be a little bit longer now because we actually have a wildfire about 15 minutes away from us. So it's blocking off a couple of the roads. Um, don't worry it blows the other way. So it's not coming anywhere near us. Um, but, you know, came out here and, you know, the obviousness of being the only person of color probably in this town at the moment um, was a massive like, oh, okay. But in reality, it, it was really like, oh, here's a new person in town. Um, here's someone new and they live over there because it's real small. So you know where everybody lives, um, which is one of the wildest things for me. But um, we've always had this idea of um, creating artwork in Wyoming. Um, we've actually been able to, over the years, network with some people, um, Laramie, who do a lot of work. Um, and you know, we really wanted to do something in this town. Um, so my partner created a, a mural um, and that I've been so, uh, so excited and so blessed to be able to work on um, with her and along with our really good friend. Uh, her name is Helen, our friend is Sam. Um, and we've been able to, uh, in the last couple of weeks, paint this mural that you know, we, we thought, we knew it was going to be something that was, it's 40 foot wide wall, um, 22 feet tall. And we knew it was going to be something that was going to be different for this community. Um, they've never had a mural that big, um, let alone, you know, anything that like really captivating. They've had a couple of signs and, you know, people would paint stuff a little bit, but nothing really in that kind of way. And you know, as we were painting it, people would come by, stop by, say hi, and be like, what are you doing? You know, like, we're painting a mural. And they're like, that's cool. And then kind of like wander off. But as it developed and people got to see more and more of what it is, it actually says, uh, greetings from Wyoming, which is a very simple kind of like postcard theme uh, mural. But one of the things we realized is that it's right off of a road that is the road in from Colorado. Uh, so it's the one of the first intersections, major like intersections you see this, this big mural that says greetings from Wyoming, welcoming you into this place, into this town, um, into this county. And, you know, as we are, we're actually just about to seal it up um, in a couple of days, but um, we've actually had people sort of turn off now and pull over to the side of the road and uh, we're getting emails and phone calls from around the state of people saying, hey, I heard about that mural you, you did. That's so great. You know, we're going to come and see it. And so now it, it's transformed just a singular wall into a destination. And I think this like ties back to the conversation that we're having about public art and transforming a place and, you know, people and you know, inviting people into a space that, you know, they might have not been able to, you know, feel like they were, you know, had a welcoming sign for. And I think what's great about, you know, Bertram's project and, you know, conversation with Hanks is that you have this soundscape and this listening space in this park, which I think is amazing. And then you have a place to sit down <laughs> and then listen and engage. So you, you not only are engaging with the sculpture itself just by like seeing it, but you get to sit down and now you have a soundscape around you to listen and invites you to really take in all of the work and all of the park and all of the beauty 
that is around you. So, so um, I and you put the mural on Instagram, and I was like, oh, it's it's beautiful. Um, it is like so. It's like what you know. We all hate this word now, but like it's so Instagrammable. So um, <laughs> I feel like it's gonna catch on really well. Um, but I want to go back to Brian. Uh, we've got like ten more minutes, so I don't. I don't. Oh, wow. ten more minutes. Um, I know it goes by so fast, but I want to go back to Brian because Brian, when you when we talked on Monday, kind of we're ending our conversation a little bit about um, you know as public art as signage, which I thought was really interesting, and public art as um, as kind of a mirror. And can you can you talk a little bit about that and what that means? Yeah, I think that as a form of visual communication, any public art is going to function as some kind of signage. It'll, it'll be directing firstly your gaze to identify it in the landscape as, as something that stands out in some way. Um, the color palette, the shape, um, sort of spatial orientation, you know, the way that it's installed a fourth bluff along the trails makes it easy to have a sight line for it. So it's it's a signage, it's like an advertisement for itself, but it also signals something about its intent, the artist's intent, um, the narratives behind it. And I think that in this case, it's an invitation to see uh, more of Hank's work once you learn who the artist is. I um, also think that art can be a mirror. And I think that one of the great things about these sculptures and, and Hank's work at large is it's a very wide open mirror that asks, um, invites people to see themselves in the work, to see themselves um, as active participants, firstly in that form of art engagement, but also as a further application um, as participants in the world, as people who are alive and able, you know, that's in my conversations with him, I feel like I can, I can really speak to that intent. He wants the art to be a transformative experience in itself, but not to stop there, to, to use it as a springboard, to go out um, more aware of yourself, maybe more aware of your body, your mind, uh, your capability. And so um, I think great art functions as both signage and mirror. I love that. That was my my last nugget of Brian from our Monday conversation <laughs> with art as this mirror, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, we do have a question about uh, environmental factors like weather, and uh, it's kind of like two questions, I think. But um, the question is, how has environmental factors, both weather, wildfires, floods, health, interactive, and political Confederate statues elections have affected the public art sector in such highly visible spaces like the river parks? Um, and I kind of want to, I kind of want to throw this in, in Bertram's direction. Um, cause I think it's interesting, you know, we don't have any like live shows happening right now. So these artists that you're getting to record stuff haven't been able to perform in since, you know, before March. So, you know, how, how does this kind of format change that? And, um, can you talk a little bit about from the artist perspective, how they feel, um, you know, in this kind of installation? Uh, sure, I think we um, yeah, we are working with folks, both you know writers and performers, who and I think all creatives might be able to relate to the, like the impact or the drag that this season has kind of been potentially uh, on being able to get stuff out uh, and communicate. And you know, I'll say that the um, artists themselves i feel have been like being healed through this process as well uh firstly by being able to create and collaborate on something so uh meaningful and potentially impactful but personally and like i joked around earlier like for me the work that we are doing is helping to like ground me uh and inspire me to uh, continue to create and to continue to um try to um, um, yeah, have the impact that we are set to have as artists. And I don't know, Ruby, do you want me to chime in on 
I'm specifically interested in that political piece of that uh, question. Is that cool? I um, I love this opportunity. I feel like it's so unique in the conversation that this visible space that this Fort Blood Park has been having with the surrounding community and to really help like co-create with this amazing team, this like full circle moment by um, providing this offering for people who I said in the video have dealt with so much trauma for so long and to be able to, again, in concert with Hank and team to be able to really start to undo a lot of the bullshit, you know, and really um, kind of hopefully embolden people to um, to uh, to rise up in spite of um, this, especially this somewhat um, trauma inducing political climate that we are navigating. And so I think that the timing of this is so important, uh, being able to share in outdoor space uh, in a way that is safe. Uh, and being able to curate experiences that are also safe but super intentional, I feel like makes this thing feel almost divinely inspired. Uh, yes, yeah, just yes. Um, we have not very much time left. I just wanted to see if anybody had any last minute thoughts and then I was gonna kind of give just a wrap up on how people can kind of stay connected. But do you guys have any last thoughts or anything that I didn't ask that you wanted to cover? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I think we covered a lot. I mean, I just I think it's I think the the you know the theme of the the conversation really being the transformative nature of public art and you know it's 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 really great to talk to an artist who's working currently to create the work for the park you know and see how it's transforming and you know coming from my perspective of you know already having this artwork made and you know being able to just put it in the park but to revisit it and also be able to have the experience from bertram that he's providing us you know and create a new experience um now from the two works together um, I think is just really powerful and I personally cannot wait to be able to experience that myself. So I'll say that and then the See, now up. you have to come. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. what, Ruby, I wanted to chime in and this is piggybacking off of Will's point. I, I feel that, and Will and I just kind of talked about this uh, around the importance of like artists slash activists maintaining a wellness practice. And that of course relates to like you know everyday folks right and i've been kind of fashioning this idea around like how public art and public health kind of marry like they serve each other in really what in really important ways and thinking through that lens like artists like we are providing like some affordable health care for people and so we're really <laughs> radical you know I mean? <laughs> yes <Yeah>. yes so <laughs> brian i just is there anything else? Yeah, I love that, Bertram. And I just want to say one of the great things about having the sculptures out there for 20 months is that there are opportunities to continue to engage them. Uh, the project that Bertram is discussing is just sort of like an, an amazing way to do that. Um, I've also been in conversation for many months now with uh, Marcel at that Collage Dance Collective about there being uh, an engagement with the uh, dancers uh, and the sculptures. Um, it may initially take a video component um, and you know, all, all these nonprofits are just trying to like take it one week at a time, but I, I feel like that is on the way in the duration of the sculptures being out there. So that's a thing to stay tuned for. Uh, but I think we'll also be able to find other touch points for the Memphis community to make their time with the sculpture special. And I hope they um, are sold to a Memphis collector and get to stay in the city. <laughs> I'm doing what I can to spread the word about that opportunity among my channel. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't know how they're ever gonna leave the park now that we're doing this poetry thing. So uh, we're gonna have to find a way to make that happen. Um, so I just wanna wrap up by saying thank you so much guys for sitting in and having this conversation with me today. Um, if you guys want to follow along with the project, just go to our website, Memphis 
uh, riverparks.org. Um, and you can just see kind of like updates as we go. The, the installation should be by the end of the month. So just be looking out for um, that launch date. But we're really excited to get all the speakers and subwoofers, which I'm most excited about, into the park. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's all we've got. Thank you, guys.